coffees that we buy, they all relate to our concept of traceability. And every day when I go to work, I ask myself questions about the work that I do in that field. And so rather than stand up here and give a lecture about what it is that I do and what traceability means to me, I also want us to have a conversation so this will be a little bit different from, I think, a lot of the knowledge talks that y'all have experienced before in that I'm gonna ask a lot of questions because my job as a journalist is to gain knowledge by asking questions of other people. And I believe that knowledge is something that's best exchanged rather than just, you know, you don't need it dripping from my lips like little golden nuggets. Um, I want us to learn together rather than me just feeding you what I already know. So I'm gonna use this opportunity a little bit selfishly because I want you to gain, you to give me as much knowledge as I'm able to give to you. So know that as I go through this presentation, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions. They're not rhetorical questions. If you don't answer them, I'll just be standing up here awkwardly like, hey, good thing I put on this roughly shirt. Um, so do feel free to just shout out uh, an answer. We also have some um, a microphone that'll be wandering around. So if there's a, a something that you want to say that's a little bit longer, there will be some parts of this that are actually a conversation, and that will help all of us, I think, walk away with more knowledge. Are we all on board with that? Does that sound okay? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, great. I love a verbal consent. It's like when you're sitting in the exit row. Okay, so. We are gonna talk about coffee traceability. Um, the first thing that I wanna do as we get started up is to establish what the word traceability means. I mean, I think we all basically have an idea of what traceability is, but I want us to, to really sort of start to say what it is that we expect when we hear the term traceability and it's applied to coffee. What are some of the things that you expect when you know that a coffee has traceability? What are some of the pieces of information that you expect to see? Shout them out. Origin. Origin, like the country of origin? Okay. The farm. Anything else? Processing. The processing information? Species. Species, like Arabica or Conifera? Okay. And variety. Anything else? What conditions? Oh, like the conditions of that the coffee was grown under, the conditions of the workers and stuff? Excellent. Someone else over here said that every stop along the way, so the supply chain, the chain of custody for that coffee, awesome. Anything else? Does the coffee's story, the story of how that farmer came to acquire the farm or the story of the mill, uh, its foundation, does that seem to be part of traceability as well? Okay, great, so some nods and a verbal, yes, I love it, great. Awesome, so this is basically what I do. Like 60% of what I do every day is take individual coffees that a company like us, Cafe Imports, that we sell, and I gather information from our green team, our green buyers, and from our export partners, and I create these things. These are available on our website. We call them beanologies, which is like a really cheesy word, uh, to basically say that it's a profile that tells you information about the coffee itself. So you see on the top there, uh, there's a, ooh, I can almost point at it. There's a P number, that means the product number. That means the individual lot of coffee that's available for sale. And then this is a particular coffee from a farmer named Arnulfo Leguizamo. Um, the coffee comes from his farm called Finca Primavera, um, and it is a farm that's located in San Agustin in Huila, Colombia. Underneath that, you see that there's all this other data about this particular coffee. Um, the variety that it is, it's a Katura, the elevation of the farm, the average elevation of the farm, uh, the processing method, and then a story about the farm itself and about how Cafe Imports met Arnolfo and a little bit about his history. Um, there's a beautiful picture of him with his wife and son. This is what I basically do for a living, is compile this information and put it into a format and put it out there onto our website so that someone who buys this coffee has access to this information and they can use it in their own marketing materials and they can also use this information to make purchasing decisions. Now, the more that I do this work, the more that I do the compiling and the sharing of this information, the more I come to ask myself questions about the information that we're sharing. How are we getting it? What are we asking for? How are we sharing it? So that's 
But what I'm actually here to talk about today is kind of the primary function of my job, is the traceability, the profiles of the individual coffees, and the, the ways that we have come to expect traceability for uh, coffees and what they mean. So far so good? Yeah. Tight, awesome. So, God, isn't it great when the slide is like the most predictable, here's the definition of a word kind of a slide. It's like I took PowerPoint 101 before I came here. Um, so the other thing that I wanna point out as we kind of get started up on this conversation about traceability and specialty coffee is that traceability and specialty coffee arguably have never existed uh, separate from one another. The term specialty coffee was actually coined in the 1970s by a woman named Erna Knudsen, who was working in a large, um, a large commercial brokerage in the west coast of the United States. And what she was really interested in was developing a marketplace for coffees that were special based on the way that they taste, they taste um, different from the large kind of bulk brand, uh, b broader kind of classifications of coffee. So she had this idea that you could buy a coffee that was just from Colombia, or you could buy a coffee that was specifically from Cauca or from a specific region within Cauca. And that coffee from Cauca tasted different from the coffee from Tolima and that coffee from Nariño and that coffee from um, Antioquia. And she thought that there was something special about the terroir of coffee that made individual micro regions taste different from one another. So she coined the term specialty coffee as a way of identifying micro regions. I mean, we would consider them still macro regions, I think at this point, if we're just talking about departments in Colombia. But, but she was really identifying the individual characteristics of a place that made a coffee taste different from coffees from elsewhere. And that was the first time that people had really focused on those types of differentiations in order to identify coffees that were more valuable and more um, pleasurable or more, more a connoisseur kind of uh, products for us to enjoy on the marketplace. So obviously since the 1970s, since Erna Knudsen coined this term, she just passed away last year. Actually, you can read some really wonderful obituaries and, and remembrances of her. She was a Spitfire. Um, but since the term was coined, we have become much more sophisticated as an industry. We've also, uh, alongside with the development of different areas of the marketplace itself, we've also really experienced a boom in the ways that we communicate information, both the ways that we gather information about coffees and the way that we share it. Um, in the 1970s, there was no such thing as Twitter. There was no such thing as these elaborate websites with all this information. My job obviously did not exist at that time. Um, and so these days, the ways that we gather and share traceability information is completely different from what Erna Knudsen had in mind. And that's also a little bit of what I wanna talk about today. Now, when I talk about traceability in this particular conversation, I, I'm specifically mentioning it in reference to our marketing use, not necessarily in terms of the bookkeeping or in terms of the record keeping or financial transactions necessarily, but really primarily what we present about coffee to a more general public, just to kind of clarify. Still good? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I could literally talk about traceability all day, and if you ask any of my colleagues, I actually do, um, to much to their chagrin most of the time. There are three things in particular that I wanna bring to this audience today that I hope that we can uh, converse about. Uh, I, we only have a little bit of time together, so I hope to get to all three, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but the three things that I absolutely wanna bring up while we're in this conversation are traceability and its relationship to quality, quality and its relationship to price, and then marketing and ethics. Um, if we don't quite get to elaborate on everything because I get the hook uh, and I get dragged off of stage for some reason, um, afterwards we should have some time to also chat and I would love to have this conversation. I will literally talk about traceability in the middle of the night if you wake me up with a text message. Like any time, it's really annoying, but I'm absolutely down for this conversation anytime. Um, so, let's we will this is just the beginning so to speak okay so the first thing is traceability and quality um so we already established in the first set of questions that i asked the types of information that we expect when we see that a coffee has traceability it's elevation the farm name the region things like that the variety um first of all i want to ask a very broad question which is 
Do you all in the audience naturally assume that if a coffee has traceability, it is of a high quality? Yes, like generally speaking, a coffee that has traceability versus one that doesn't have traceability. You would assume that the coffee that has traceability is higher quality, right? Yeah, and I mean, if I were to speculate, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but if I were to speculate, I would say that part of the reason for that is like, why go to the trouble if it's not good? Like why tell exactly where it's from and what it's, what, what makes it taste a certain way if it doesn't taste good. We don't want to put lipstick on a pig, right? <laughs> like, is it generally that you would say that? Like, that signals to you that there's something about that coffee that makes it special. So, I also will ask, you as coffee professionals, or if there's anyone in the audience who's not a coffee professional, what about, like, what individual elements of what we already defined as traceability, the variety, the location, the processing, which of those things do you specifically look for when you're trying to identify if a coffee is going to be what you perceive to be high quality? Variety, Variety processing, taste. Origin. origin, like taste. the country, the region, taste, taste, like tasting notes, great, the scores. the scores, do you ever look for elevation, do you look for like farm elevation? Okay, does the story imply something about quality to you? If you can read the story of a coffee on the bag, does that imply that the coffee's higher quality? I'm seeing some nods, okay, cool, great. Are there things in your experience that you buy even though you don't know the traceability of it? Like are there brands that you go to whose products you expect high quality from even though you don't know anything about where those products come from? Like, does anyone here wear Nike shoes? And you go to Nike because you believe that Nike is a high quality brand and you don't necessarily need to know about the origin of where those things are made. Do you think that you would pay more money if you knew where those things were made from? Or do you think you just basically trust a brand to give you a high quality product? Depends. Depends. Sure, like anything else, right? Like it depends, totally. Cool. So one of the things that I think about a lot when I think about my relationship with traceability and the impression that I have about quality is when I'm going to buy wine. And wine is a, a relationship, it's a comparison that we make a lot in specialty coffee, at least in the United States. I don't know if it's similar here. I know that uh, Australia has a really strong wine industry as well. So it might be different, it might be comparable. You can correct me. I'm totally welcome to have you disagree with me, by the way. Um, but when I look at wine bottles and I think about the ways that we talk about coffee and coffee connoisseur connoisseurship in the same kind of way that we talk about wine connoisseurship, I'm usually really astounded by how little information is actually presented on a wine label. When you go into a, a wine shop or a bottle shop, you'll often see what the country that the, that the wine is from. Sometimes you'll see the micro region that the wine is from, like what part of France maybe. Um, oftentimes you'll see a variety listed. Sometimes you'll see the percentage of the variety of grapes that are listed in that wine. And usually that's just about it. I know that sometimes there are tasting notes, like sometimes it'll tell you what the wine kind of tastes like, and sometimes it'll tell you what you should eat while you're drinking that wine. And in the United States, I don't know if it's true here, but in the United States, most of the label is taken up by a warning that tells you not to operate heavy machinery while you're drinking the wine, um, which is probably the most significant information that we could have, but it doesn't tell you anything about how it tastes. One of the really interesting things to me about the way that wine is marketed is that you almost never see the name of the person who owns the winery. You almost never see a picture of the person who owns the winery. And you ne almost never see any information about the farm itself or the processing, right? You never see the elevation that those grapes are grown at. You almost never see any information about the maceration style, the wine skin contact time, the, from the tank that the fermentation happens in, which is actually has a huge impact on the flavor of the wine. Um, if you're lucky, you will get some kind of information about maybe the story of that family or that, that processing manufacturing plant. 
Um, but very little actual specific information. You certainly don't get serving suggestions, which we often see on coffee bags, right? Like a little Chemex icon, or a little espresso icon, or uh, something about how to brew. No, you've never seen a bottle of wine that comes with instructions on how to open it, <laughs> and how to take the liquid into your mouth, aspirate it, draw it across your entire palate, make everyone else in the room uncomfortable making as much noise as you possibly can. Um, I think it's really interesting for us to think about the ways that we equate wine marketing and coffee marketing, and also to remember that part of the reason that we get the information that we get about wine, as opposed to the information that we get about coffee, is that the person who bottles the wine is also the person who usually owns the farm, who owns the oversees the processing of that grape, who oversees the bottling of it and the quality control of it, and often who oversees the marketing of it. So the, the whole system is very much vertically integrated in a way that coffee is not. And it's, I, it's not, uh, an accident, the amount of information that a winemaker shares about the wine and about themselves on the bottles. So far, so good. Does anyone use price, by the way, to indicate what kind of wine you want to buy? Does anyone like go specifically for price? Because I, yeah, and the label, like how cute it is, like, yeah, if it, could, if it looks good on the table, absolutely. I mean, come on, we're all only human. Um, so yeah, for me personally, I usually, I know that there are certain countries I can rely on. I know that there are certain couple of uh, regions, a grape variety, and then I go for price. Like what I have a minimum that I have decided that I will pay for wine because I'm, I'm worth it, you know? The days of like really cheap wine are kind of over for me. Um, no judgments if anyone's still drinking wine. I'll still share it if you want to share it, but I'm not going to buy. Um, so yeah, so like price is a big indicator for me as well. It's like the piece of information that's going to make or break the decision. So here's an interesting thing too about coffee. All of the traceability information that we typically share is about the raw material. It's about what the producer has control over, what the producer did to the coffee, right? The Where the farm is located, what variety the coffee is, what the producer did in order to process that bean. Um, very rarely do we see anything on our bags about the value that's added by the roaster. Almost never will you see the equipment that the roast that the coffee is roasted on. Um, almost never will you see the uh, information about what the charge temp was or what the rate of rise was. Or if we get a roast degree, it's usually the broadest term: light, medium, or dark. Even though everyone in this room knows. Light means any number of things, and medium means any number of things. And we want to know whether the farm is at 1,580 meters or 1,570 meters, but we don't want to share the information about what the ag transport is of that coffee. The first question that I ask myself when I go into work every day is why does traceability stop at the green coffee? Why is it that we don't share information about how we add value to that coffee in order to actually make it soluble and to actually make it consumable? Nobody can drink green coffee, so I mean, who cares what the elevation is because I can't drink the coffee when it comes off the, straight off the farm. Um, so it is interesting to me to first to start thinking about the information that we share and what we're not willing to share about the work that we do, including the story of the experience of the roaster. How experienced is this roaster? How long have they been roasting coffee? How, what kind of a machine are you using? Um, 